All right, thanks everyone for being patient. Uh, looks like we got everyone in from the waiting room and hopefully folks have joined us now on the webcast. Um, Brandon, if you are ready, could you switch to the next slide for me? Thank you. So welcome and thank you for joining the public workshop on the draft of the statewide general stormwater, I'm sorry, statewide construction stormwater general permit reissuance. Um, I'm Amy Cronson. I'm the unit chief of the industrial and construction stormwater program at the State Water Resources Control Board, and I'll be the facilitator for today's workshop. Uh, as we start this workshop, I'd like to introduce our program staff. We have Brandon Rosenboom, who will be presenting information and answering questions. And behind the scenes, we have Ella Golovi, Tiana Huling, our Cali PA webcasting staff, and we are also joined today by the section chief over the surface water permitting section, Diana Messina. Next slide. We are hosting this meeting virtually from Sacramento today, and we welcome and thank you for joining us. We appreciate your participation while many people are concurrently dealing with the continued impacts of the pandemic um, and the impacts on our communities. Uh, the Water Board's mission is to preserve, enhance, and restore California's water resources for the benefit of present and future generations, which is why we want to begin this meeting by acknowledging the groups who have and continue to experience economic, environmental, and social disadvantages as a result of historical marginalization and whose daily lives are impacted by racism and injustices. As a reminder, our work here today should strengthen the empowerment of community voices as we work together to provide clean, safe, and affordable water to all Californians. Uh, in today's workshop, we will pro be providing information, answering questions, and listening to your feedback regarding the draft construction stormwater general permit that was noticed on May 28, 2021. The draft technical documents can be found on our program's web, web page. Um, also a note, state water board members may be in attendance today, but there will be no action taken and this is not a hearing. Um, so this workshop is being recorded and webcast. This is an informal discussion, no written responses to comments and no formal action will be taken. Questions will be answered to the best of staff's ability. There will be a break during the question and answer period, um, as long as we have enough questions. Yesterday, it ended up working out that we just powered through and didn't have a break, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, the PowerPoint presentation will be provided on our website um, once we can uh, post it. Should take a couple of days, but um, if you would like to request a copy of the presentation, you're welcome to email our stormwater at waterboards.ca.gov email address, and that will be up on the screen uh, a little bit later today. Um, I'd also like you to consider signing up on the website for the Lyris email subscription for further updates regarding construction stormwater or stormwater programs at all. So today there are two meeting options. We have a Cali PA webcast that you can watch live. We also have an interactive Zoom meeting. Um, the Zoom meeting is limited to 300 participants. We've not hit that yet. Um, but if you're not planning to ask questions or provide feedback, you can join the webcast and just watch. Um, and then here's that email address. If you need technical assistance, please contact stormwater at waterboards.ca.gov with the subject line technical assistance with CGP workshop meeting and uh, the staff behind the scenes will uh, try to help you and answer your questions. So, um, oops, for Zoom participant, sorry, go ahead, Brandon. <laughs> for Zoom participant instructions, we're gonna take all questions through the chat function. Um, you can enter your question there, or you can indicate if you'd like to present your question verbally, and you'll have one minute max to ask, to ask your question. And then we'll be responding to all the questions verbally. So today is our, uh, here's our agenda for today. Um, we're doing welcome and introduction now. Brandon Rosenboom will be giving a staff presentation. We'll do questions and answers, and depending on the length of that, we'll take a break. 
and then continue questions and answers. And finally, we'll do the next steps of the permitting process where we discuss the schedule moving forward. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Brandon Rosenboom. He's a water resource control engineer here at State Water Board in the Industrial and Construction Stormwater Unit, as well as the Construction Stormwater uh, Lead for the program. Thanks, Brandon. Thank you for the introduction, Amy, and uh, good morning, everyone. I know this is an early workshop. <laughs> Um, so we're going to start off with a little bit of background on what the um, construction general permit is. So the Federal Clean Water Act prohibits certain discharges of stormwater containing pollutants to waters of the United States, except those in compliance with a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. The State Water Board adopted the existing construction stormwater general permit um, in 2009 to regulate stormwater discharges associated with construction activities, disturbing one or more acres of land. The existing construction stormwater general permit expired on September 2nd of 2014 and has been administratively extended until the effective date of a new construction stormwater general permit. Um, over the past uh, 11 plus years, we've uh, learned a lot through implementing the existing construction stormwater general permit. Um, what has been working and what has not been working. Therefore, we are proposing a number of changes um, for the reissuance of this construction stormwater general permit. The primary topics that we'll be covering today include um, the reorganization of the draft permit, passive treatment technology use requirements, total maximum daily load implementation requirements, uh, the implementation of the statewide water quality control plans, dewatering activity requirements, and demolition activity uh, requirements. Continuing on, we'll be discussing the criteria for the notice of non applicability, revisions to the notice of termination process, um, the federal sufficiently sensitive test methods rule, revisions to our monitoring and reporting and then the removal of the bioassessment and uh, rain event action plans uh, requirements in the 2009 permit. As you can see, we have a lot to cover today. Um, this list is very similar to what we discussed in our workshops on the preliminary staff draft in December of 2020. However, for each topic, I'm going to uh, highlight the changes between the May 2021 draft and the draft that we released last November. Um, based on the feedback that we have received, from our interested parties and stakeholders. For those of you who are um, used to the 2009 construction general permit, you may have noticed a uh, difference in the organization of the permit requirements. Throughout the implementation cycle of the 2009 permit, we have heard uh, feedback that it is difficult to navigate um, the requirements. So we have done some reorganization in an attempt to address this. In the order, we start off with the findings, then define which projects require coverage, um, and then discuss applying, revising, and terminating that permit coverage, followed by the requirements that apply to all uh, dischargers. Um, Attachment A for the linear underground and overhead projects had a lot of the same content that the order um, had. And so we decided to just consolidate the two into one order um, and then leave attachment A just as the requirements that are specific to linear underground and overhead projects. We also uh, reorganized attachments uh, A, C, and D, or C, A, C, D, and E so that they flow through the minimum best management practices, um, then the monitoring requirements, followed by the reporting requirements. And we think that just makes more sense chronologically. Compared to the 2009 permit, there are four new attachments for passive treatment, um, total maximum daily load implementation, the exceptions to the ocean plan, and the watering requirements. These attachments are separated out so that dischargers who need to implement these requirements can jump to that attachment rather than sifting through the requirements elsewhere in the permit. Appendix one, which was previously an Excel spreadsheet has been converted into a Word document to improve its accessibility to our com community members. Um, the Word document does not have any calculation capabilities. 
However, dischargers will be using smarts to input that information anyways. And um, the, the formulas are rather simple and can be done with a, a phone or a hand calculator. And those are outlined in the Word document. One thing I would like to note is that when you're using the uh, PDF versions of these documents is that the PDF will actually allow you to navigate to the section that you are interested in by opening the uh, contents panel. There you can select on various levels of section headings to locate the requirements that you are focusing on. Next up, we'll be moving to the passive treatment technology use requirements. Um, treatment chemicals, which cause the coagulation and flocculation of suspended solids, are often used to meet the turbidity numeric action levels in stormwater, um, especially in uh, the construction stormwater general permit. The 2009 construction stormwater general permit only addresses treatment chemicals that are used within active treatment systems. These are enclosed systems um, that can be monitored for toxicity prior to discharging that um, treated water. Passive treatment technologies differ from active treatment as they are applied outside of these enclosed computerized systems um, and do not rely on pumps, filters, or uh, real-time controls. Um, regulatory requirements for passive treatment technologies are currently implemented in uh, the US EPA permit, as well as other states such as North Carolina, Washington, and I believe a few more have added uh, to their requirements as well. The passive treatment technology requirements found in attachment G um, specifically apply to products or chemicals that are applied to um, water, such as uh, a detention pond or sedimentation basin um, or within concentrated runoff streams. Stakeholders worked with the state water board staff to develop the proposed requirements. The intent of the proposed passive treatment technology requirements is to prevent construction stormwater discharges from creating potentially toxic conditions um, in waterways by specifying which chemicals can be used, um, design and application methods, as well as the monitoring and reporting requirements for using these chemicals. The preliminary staff draft um, originally sought to impose requirements for passive treatment chemicals that were mixed into bonded fiber matrices, uh, hydromulches, and spray tack fires. However, based on feedback from interested parties, Staff determined that it would be more appropriate to remove um, the requirement for uh, bonded fiber matrices, hydromulches, and spray tackifiers, which we consider um, land applied uses of passive treatment. Um, we, we decided to remove those from requirements uh, associated with the water applied ones. Um, those, the requirements that we do want to focus for um, th these land applications are going to be in the uh, erosion and sediment control parts of the uh, risk level attachments. Passive treatment chemicals can vary in active ingredients, dose amounts, application methods, and aquatic toxicities. They can take the form of liquids, liquid powders, um, socks, and blocks, amongst other applications. Dischargers should be familiar with the chemicals characteristics by reviewing safety data sheets, toxicological information, um, and the manufacturer's instructions. Commonly used cationic treatment chemicals, such as positively charged polyacrylamides or PAMs, can be toxic to aquatic life and um, can enter the environment through stormwater runoff. Thus, they are prohibited by this proposed general permit. On the other hand, anionic, which are the negatively charged um, particles, and the non-ionic um, polyacrylamides which are neutrally charged, are generally less toxic, but still have to be dosed properly um, to avoid adverse effects in discharges. In the preliminary staff draft, we had proposed to involve the qualified SWIP developer heavily in the calculations to uh, properly dose and apply passive treatment chemicals. Um, but we heard that this is too burdensome for our dischargers, uh, who often hire knowledgeable and experienced contractors to follow the manufacturer's guidance when applying passive treatment products. And so we've tried to reflect that um, change in our uh, requirements regarding passive technology use um, and uh, are having the qualified SWIP developer be more of a uh, quality assurance um, type role. 
Next up, we'll be moving on to the implementation of adopted total maximum daily loads, known as TMDLs. Total maximum daily loads are existing regulations that have been through separate public processes when adopted into a regional water, uh, regional water board water quality control plan, uh, also known as a basin plan, to address Clean Water Act 303D listed impaired water bodies. So when a water body is impaired, um, that means it has a, uh, you know, a level of pollutants that are impacting the beneficial uses of that water body. And that might be its fishability, its swimmability, um, its drinkability. Total maximum daily loads are adopted by the regional water boards or the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. A total maximum daily load is the sum of allowable loads of a single pollutant from um, all contributing sources. So this would be non-point sources, uh, point sources, background sources, and uh, it, they also include a margin of safety. Total maximum daily loads are not self-implementing and must be implemented through requirements and permits or other state water board actions or regional water board actions. The existing um, permit order, uh, which is the 2009 construction general permit, already includes a list of potentially, uh, potentially applicable total maximum daily loads, um, though that list is outdated and uh, does not have implementation requirements associated with them. The proposed general permit reissuance intends to update that list with existing total maximum daily loads um, that are applicable to construction stormwater dischargers and then pair those with implementation requirements. Total maximum daily loads assign waste load allocations to point sources, which is the maximum pollutant load from each point source um, that can be discharged to the TMDL listed water body or watershed. Stormwater discharges associated with construction activities regulated by this construction general permit are generally considered point sources of pollutants and are thus uh, assigned waste load allocations. We are proposing to implement a total of uh, 68 total maximum daily loads um, in this construction general permit, which represent a variety of pollutant categories, including indicator bacteria, uh, chloride and salts, diazinon, nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, sediment, temperature, metals, and other um, pollutants that are toxic to aquatic life. Many of these pollutants are associated with sediment, which is commonly discharged by construction projects as a result of their land disturbing activities. Responsible dischargers is a new a term that we're in, uh, including into the proposed permit, um, which was kind of adopted from the industrial stormwater general permit. Um, so uh, responsible dischargers are dischargers with coverage under the construction stormwater general permit who discharge stormwater associated with construction activities um, either directly or through a, a municipal separate storm sewer system to the impaired bodies, uh, water bodies or watersheds that were identified in a US EPA adopted and approved um, total maximum daily load. And uh, they're only responsible dischargers if there was a waste load allocation assigned to construction stormwater sources um, and have identified one or more total maximum daily loads uh, specific pollutants in the uh, construction sites, construction from water discharge. Due to the variety of pollutants and the waste load allocations assigned to address them, staff have developed multiple implementation strategies consistent with the assumptions of, and requirements of the total maximum daily loads. The intent was to streamline compliance by leveraging and modifying existing permit requirements where possible. Existing requirements, such as a uh, pollutant source assessment, source control and best management practices, soil loss modeling, also known as Russell 2, um, non-visible pollutant monitoring and reporting are the basis of our uh, proposed total maximum daily load implementation requirements. There are four categories of total maximum, implementa or total maximum daily load implementation requirements. The first is uh, compliance with the general permit requirements, where those are already sufficient to comply with the total maximum daily load. This essentially means in order to comply with the total maximum daily load, you do not have to do anything beyond complying with the construction stormwater general permit. Technically, all 
dischargers have to comply in all four uh, categories of um, total mass on daily load implementation requirements have to comply with the construction general permit requirements. Um, the second category is compliance with erosion and sediment control uh, BMPs, best management practices, paired with soil loss modeling um, using Russell 2 to demonstrate compliance with mass based waste load allocations, which are typically associated for uh, sediment and pollutants that are bound to sediment. The third uh, category is compliance with total maximum daily load related numeric action levels to comply with concentration based waste load allocations that are assigned in the receiving water. And lastly, compliance with uh, total maximum daily load related numeric effluent limitations to comply with concentration based waste load allocations that are assigned at the point of discharge. So that's the main difference between numeric action levels and effluent limitations. Um, one, the waste load allocation was, uh, for numeric action levels, the waste load allocation was assigned in the receiving water. For numeric effluent limitations, they're really looking at the discharge that is coming off the construction stormwater site. Both the total mass on daily load related numeric action levels and effluent limitations are proposed for assessment through the non-visible pollutant monitoring requirements of the permit. Um, and these are applicable to all dischargers uh, requ um, and they're required to do so when there is a breach, failure, or malfunction of a best management practice um, or spillage of materials that can be transported uh, by stormwater. One of the bigger changes in the May 2021 draft is that staff has redefined what it means to exceed a total maximum daily load numeric action level or effluent limitation. Instead of a single sample limit, we have defined an exceedance as being two or more analytical results per pollutant, per discharge location, per reporting year, over the value that is listed um, in attachment H, table H2, for the specific pollutant water body combination. This was based off similar implementation requirements uh, found in the industrial stormwater general permit. So to reiterate, the exceedance of a numeric effluent limitation occurs when two samples are measured over the limit in a given reporting year. This means that the site would need to meet several conditions before incurring a violation of the permit. First, they would have to be a source of the pollutant in question um, as listed in the total maximum daily load and in their uh, pollutant source assessment. Um, secondly, they would have to have a breach, malfunction, or spill, which would trigger the non-visible um, pollutant monitoring. Three, they would have to have a sample that is measured above the limit. And then four, they would have to repeat that again and have that second, uh, that second value that's over the, um, the listed numeric action level or effluent limitation in order to uh, get an exceedance. The 68 total maximum daily loads are assigned, uh, assigned a total of a 204 waste load allocations uh, to specific pollutant water body combinations. The pie chart to the left depicts how these 204 waste load allocations are split into the implementation requirements. 20, 28 are proposed to be addressed by complying with um, the construction stormwater general permit requirements, eight of which intend to address uh, bacteria total maximum daily loads by emphasizing minimum best management practices that focus on sanitation. So this means, you know, controlling um, your, your portable toilets or controlling your septic waste transport, um, seeing if there's any uh, potential for exposure there. That uh, one little sliver that's um, in purple between the yellow and the green represents the Los Peñas Quitos uh, Lagoon sediment total mass on daily load. And this uh, total maximum daily load actually requires that dischargers submit an estimate of their discharges representative flow um, on an annual basis. In the yellow, we have 93 or roughly 45% of the waste load allocations, um, which are proposed to be addressed by uh, erosion and sediment controls paired with Russell 2 soil loss uh, modeling. Um, in the blue, we have 83 total uh, waste load allocations that are split between uh, the numeric action levels and numeric effluent limitations. So the light blue is numeric action levels, and there are about 47 there, and the dark blue is uh, numeric effluent limitations, and those um, are, there's 36 of those. 
And this slide is kind of how we uh, envision um, responsible dischargers complying uh, with the implementation requirements for total maximum daily loads. So step one, the discharger is going to determine whether or not they are a responsible discharger. Um, you know, so does this project discharge into a total maximum daily load watershed or water body? A map tool will be provided to guide dischargers similar to the existing guidance for the industrial stormwater general permit, um, which is shown to the right. It will be the discharger's responsibility to verify if the project um, discharges to the total maximum daily load watershed or water body. Secondly, um, the discharger will have to perform a site-specific pollutant source assessment. Does this site have sources of the total maximum daily load listed pollutant? Um, is there potential for that, those pollutants to be present in stormwater discharges? If not, then uh, the discharger is not considered a responsible discharger um, and they will not have to comply with the total maximum daily load implementation requirements. Um, if the discharger did determine that they are, are a responsible discharger, they would refer to attachment H for the applicable um, total maximum daily load implementation requirements um, and to determine what their site has to comply with. Okay, now we'll be moving on to a, a whole slew of other proposed permit changes. First up is um, implementation of the statewide water quality control plans. So since the construction stormwater general permit was last reissued and amended, the state water board has adopted um, statewide water quality control plans for oceanic waters, as well as inland surface waters, enclosed bays, and estuaries. These water quality control plans function similarly to uh, those adopted by the regional water boards, um, but apply to all of California. Likewise, the regulations, policies, and water quality standards established by the water quality control plans are implemented um, through other state water board orders, such as the construction stormwater general permit. The ocean plan, which was updated in uh, 2019, requires the implementation of monitoring requirements for dischargers that are directly discharging into ocean waters. The uh, monitoring requirements of the construction stormwater general permit are deemed compliant with the model monitoring provisions of the ocean plan. Additionally, the ocean plan um, prohibits the discharge of stormwater associated with construction activities to areas of special biological significance, also known as ASBS, um, unless that discharger has been granted an exception. The requirements for dischargers that are uh, granted an exception are defined in attachment I of the construction stormwater general permit. In 2015, the state water board amended the ocean plan and the state, uh, statewide water quality control plan for inland surface waters enclosed bays and estuaries and established a statewide water quality objective for trash, um, essentially a prohibition of trash discharges and implementation requirements for stormwater dischargers. The construction stormwater general permit um, reissuance proposes to implement a prohibition of trash discharges, also known as zero trash in your discharge. Um, if a discharger cannot comply with the total prohibition of trash, there are requirements to install um, a full capture system or their equivalent to prevent trash from entering waterways. Um, the proposed permit defines and incorporates implementation requirements for construction site dewatering activities to build upon the US EPA 2017 construction stormwater general permit. However, discharge is subject to a uh, separate uh, non national pollutant discharge elimination system, de minimis or low threat discharge permit are, uh, for their dewatering activities are required to obtain coverage and comply with the requirements of those separate permits. And so these might be issued by um, the uh, national pollutant discharge elimination system here at the state water board or um, by the regional water boards. The requirements in attachment J are for projects with dewatering activities that are not already re regulated through one of these separate permits. Dewatering discharges authorized by the proposed permit 
include mechanical pumping or siphoning of non-potable water from excavations, trenches, foundations, vaults, um, groundwater removal specifically related to construction activities, and or water collected in surface impoundments. These might be ponds, puddles, um, other low points on an active site. The discharger would be required to comply with some specific dewatering discharge prohibitions, such as the prohibition of um, dewatering contaminated groundwater, uh, regional water board requests, monitoring, and best management practices. The preliminary staff draft has some language that restricts the methods that can be used to dewater um, without really a, a technical justification as to why um, they are being prohibited. So we sought to address this by focusing our dewatering requirements on protecting water quality rather than um, being a, a more of a prescriptive design. The proposed permit also incorporates additional implementation requirements for demolition activities to reduce the runoff of legacy pollutants such as asbestos, lead paints, um, and uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, also known as PCBs. The basis of these requirements was the, also the US EPA's 2017 um, Construction Stormwater General Permit. Something to note here is that this applies to projects that require coverage under this general permit. Um, so they have to disturb one or more acres of land. If the demolition is occurring on a slab and the remainder of the project does not disturb soil or land, um, then the project would not need to comply with the requirements of the Construction Stormwater General Permit and thus would not need to uh, comply with the demolition activity requirements. All right, so now we're moving on to the criteria for the, the notice of non-applicability. Um, California Water Code Section 13399.30 allows a person to, uh, to claim that they are not required to obtain coverage under a National Pollutant Discharge El Elimination System permit through the notice of non-applicability process. The proposed permit defines the requirements for a discharger submitting a notice of non-applicability um, to the water boards for sites that are hydrologically disconnected from waters of the United States. The discharger would electronically certify and submit through the stormwater multiple application and report tracking system known as SMARTS, um, a technical justification that is prepared by a California licensed professional engineer or geologist, which demonstrates a site does not discharge to waters of the United States. They would also have to submit through SMARTS a document signed by the Regional Water Board Executive Officer or their delegate stating that Water Board staff concurs with the discharger's um, determination that the site does not discharge to waters of the United States. The technical justification was previously proposed in our preliminary staff draft to be performed solely by licensed California geologists. Um, but it is within the realm of capabilities of a licensed civil engineer to determine um, that a construction site does not discharge to waters of the United States as well. And so we have uh, changed our language to reflect that. Moving on, we'll be discussing the revisions to the notice of termination process. So a discharger must electronically certify and submit to the water boards a complete notice of termination um, and obtain approval to end coverage under the Construction Stormwater General Permit. The proposed permit includes the following revised requirements to expedite regional water board approval um, and to reduce the financial burden on dischargers um, continued compliance and annual fee payments if they were to continue having coverage. So first, they, uh, the discharger is required to provide additional um, uh, project-specific information for the notice of termination. This includes um, some final site drawings that indicate where things are stabilized and a photo documentation of the um, site stabilization, as well as uh, uh, a qualified stormwater or qualified SWIP practitioner um, final inspection. Uh, we've also included a, a sort of automatic 30-day approval of the notice of termination um, by the water board, if not otherwise under review or addressed by the regional water board staff. Um, so if they have not taken action on a notice of termination that was submitted after 30 days, then that notice of termination will be um, uh, automatically approved. 
Um, this is mostly the same that was proposed in the preliminary staff draft. However, we've revised the language so that it is the qualified SWIP practitioner rather than the qualified SWIP developer um, that, that performs those notice of termination visual inspections. All right. So the implementation of a new federal su sufficiently sensitive test methods rule. Uh, the US EPA has finalized minor amendments to its Clean Water Act regulations to codify that under the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System Program, uh, that the uh, dischargers must use sufficiently sensitive analytical methods uh, to, to sample and test their, their water, their stormwater discharges. The purpose of this rulemaking is to clarify that um, permittees must use uh, US EPA approved analytical methods that are capable of detecting and measuring the pollutants at or below the applicable water quality criteria or permit limitations. This general permit requires the use of sufficiently sensitive methods to meet the requirements of the amended Clean Water Act um, described above and requires the discharge to ensure all uh, laboratory analyses are sufficiently sensitive and conducted according to the procedures under um, the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, Part 136, or 40 uh, Code of Federal Regulations, Part 136, including the observation of holding times, detection limits, and other measures designed to ensure quality assurance and control. For any calculations that are required in this general permit, a value of zero will be assigned for all analytical results that are less than the minimum level as reported by the laboratory, so long as a sufficiently sensitive test method was used. And this will be evidenced um, by the uh, method detection limit and method minimum level, uh, which is referred to as a reporting limit. Uh, and these measures are designed again to uh, ensure quality assurance and quality control. That said, these uh, requirements apply to samples that discharges collect and send to a laboratory for analysis. For the most part, construction stormwater dischargers perform field sampling for um, pH and turbidity. And so uh, to comply with the sufficiently sensitive te test methods rule, uh, field sampling must be done with a calibrated instrument and that is compliant with the, the rule. Um, an example of where this may impact dischargers is through the non-visible fluid monitoring, especially when coupled with applicable total maximum daily load implementation requirements. Um, staff proposes revisions to the existing permits, monitoring, and reporting requirements as follows. The qualified SWIP developer, and uh, sorry, I haven't defined what SWIP means, uh, so SWPPP, um, stands for Stormwater Pollution Prevention Plan. So uh, the Qualified SWIP developer and Qualified SWIP practitioner um, have increased requirements to visit the site, conduct visual inspections, and assess site conditions. The Qualified SWIP developer and SWIP practitioner are required to do on-site visual inspections at periodic intervals to observe potential changes um, at the construction site. The qualified SWIP developer will, will be required to inspect at the beginning of the project when the uh, qualified SWIP developer is replaced, so if a new one is coming on board, um, twice annually and within 14 days of a numeric action level exceedance. The qualified SWIP practitioner will be required to visit the site monthly prior to precipitation events, I believe 72 hours before, within 14 days of a numeric action level exceedance, and then prior to the submittal of the notice of termination. So they're the ones responsible for uh, inspecting uh, during the notice of termination. In the preliminary staff draft, the discharger was required to collect stormwater samples during precipitation events that result in discharge. After receiving feedback from our interested parties and stakeholders, we determined that any discharge was a vague and impractical compliance trigger. Staff have defined um, in the May 2021 draft, a qualifying precipitation event as those that produce half an inch of precipitation within a 24 hour period and become extended events for subsequent days or 24 hour periods um, of a quarter or more inches of precipitation. This gives dischargers and enforcement staff a measurable amount to base their monitoring and implementation uh, requirements on. 
staff determined that half an inch was uh, an appropriate amount based on studies that concluded precipitation events tend to become more erosive with at least 0.4 inches of rain within a 24 hour period. Extended events are now defined as a quarter of an inch per 24 hour period after that initial um, half inch. So that discharges with lighter precipitation um, that generally doesn't produce discharge uh, do not have to continue to comply with applicable monitoring requirements in subsequent days. In the 2009 construction stormwater general permit, there was no duration associated with the amount of precipitation um, that triggered monitoring requirements. So we think that uh, by having this half an inch in a 24 hour period, um, this will make it clear for dischargers to know when to get out into the field and um, begin monitoring. Additionally, staff heard that uh, single sample limits for pH and turbidity uh, uh, for the numeric action levels were would be challenging for dischargers to comply with. So um, keeping them as daily averages, such as the, the 2009 permit, um, would promote dischargers to perform real-time corrective actions to improve their discharge before exceeding the numeric action level. So essentially how that plays out is when they take their first sample of the day um, and they notice that it might be high, they can actually go in and do their corrective actions during the day to um, try and get a lower uh, pH for their, um, their daily average. The 2009 permit contains bioassessment monitoring requirements uh, intended to align with a proposed state water board biological integrity policy. However, that po policy is still under development. Uh, staff has proposed to replace the current bioassessment monitoring requirements and use risk level three uh, site and type three linear underground and overhead project annual fees to fund a uh, bioassessment monitoring study. The study would be conducted through the surface water ambient monitoring program here at the water boards um, to determine if there are significant water quality, biological integrity and watershed health impacts from large high risk construction projects. The state water board could decide to include bioassessment or biological integrity requirements to implement specific water quality in uh, specific water quality control plans or policies um, via, uh, via future permit reissuances. To be clear, we are not proposing any additional receiving water monitoring requirements for our dischargers uh, to replace the bioassessment monitoring requirements. The receiving water monitoring, monitoring requirements for risk level three and um, linear underground and overhead project type three sites uh, should largely remain the same, save for a few clarifications. Um, we are also proposing to remove the rain event action plan requirements. So the existing permit includes the rain event action plans uh, to provide dischargers with a, a on-site inspection checklist for site preparation prior to precipitation events. Staff determined that the goal of the rain event action plans should be action-based rather than a uh, checklist or reporting-based requirement. So the proposed permit replaces the rain event action plans with um, increased involvement of the qualified SWIFT developer over the life of the project. Um, pre-storm inspections by the qualified SWIP practitioner, um, including their visual observations, and um, implementation of site-specific corrective actions following those uh, pre-storm or pre-precipitation uh, event inspections. So what's next? The State Water Board has recently issued a public notice indicating that the public hearing is now rescheduled for August 4th, 2021, effectively extending the public comment period. This will allow interested parties more time to form their official comments to be submitted to the clerk to the board. The public comment period will now end on August 13th, 2021, initiating the staff's formal response to comments this fall. A date um, for the State Water Board adoption meeting uh, or consideration of adoption. Option has not been determined, but we are. Um, that said, I thought it would be nice to uh, review how the State Water Board accepts comments for those of um, that may be new to this process, such as myself. 
So as a reminder, the, the full instructions for submitting comments can be found in the public notice, which is posted on the Waterboard website. Comments can be submitted orally during the uh, board hearing or as written comment letters delivered physically or electronically. When emailing comment letters, please use the subject line that is specified in the public notice. And this subject line is read as comment letter dash proposed construction stormwater general permit reissuance. Um, an address is also provided in the public notice for interested parties that are mailing their comments in. If planning to hand deliver the comments, interested parties must notify staff um, via email and schedule an appointment for that transaction. Written comments will be accepted no later than 12 p.m. noon on Friday, August 13th, 2021. Um, there's certainly nothing ominous about that date. Okay, any person desiring to receive uh, future notices concerning the proposed reissues of this general permit, including any changes to the public notice, um, should sign up for the Lyris email list as follows. They would uh, access the email list subscription form at the um, web address listed on this page, um, click the water quality tab, and then check the stormwater construction permitting issues uh, box. Um, then they will fill in their, their contact information and that will add your email to our subscription list. And with that, we will now begin our question and answer period. Amy Cronson will be facilitating the questions and feedback unless indicated that the participant would like to self-deliver their content. Great, thank you so much, Brandon. Yeah. Um, well done. So as Brandon mentioned, we're gonna open up for questions and answers. Uh, we have a few questions already in the chat box here. Um, Wayne, I saw you put several questions in here. I'm gonna break them up a little bit based on subject and then we'll move through um, and make sure we answer questions from, from all the parties. So um, to, to answer the first question, I'm gonna bring Diana Messina, our section chief for surface water permitting in. Um, so she can touch on the water quality objectives. Diana, I'll go ahead and read the question first. Does that work for you? Okay. Yes. Great. So um, provision 4D3 provides the discharger shall ensure that stormwater discharges and authorized non-stormwater discharges will not contain pollutants that cause or contribute to an exceedance of any applicable water quality objective or water quality standards contained in any applicable water quality control plan. And that's with emphasis added by the uh, questioner. Please define applicable water quality objective, applicable water quality standards, and applicable water quality control plan. Does this include secondary uh, minimum contaminant levels or goals such as phosphorus and nitrogen? Okay, great. Um, thank you. This is a good question, especially to ask upfront um, to understand the basis of our regulations that are in our regional board basin plans. Um, I, again, uh, my name's Diana Messina and I am the section chief in our division of water quality at the State Water Board. Um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and start with the basics. Um, basin plans are region specific uh, regulations that are adopted by our regional water quality control boards. We have nine regional water quality control boards throughout California. Uh, the regional water boards um, have authority on regulation over their regions. Then um, we also have our state water board um, and our state water board adopts um, water quality control plans that are statewide or that span over more than one region. So when we talk about a basin plan, we are, um, we are talking about the regulations that are adopted by a regional board specifically um, to address the water quality for the water bodies in their region. Um, so let's start. What is a water quality standard? Um, a water quality standard, um, as referred to in a basin plan, is a set of um, several items. Um, a standard is made up of um, the beneficial uses of a water body, the water quality objectives, which some people also refer to them as criteria that are needed to protect those beneficial uses, and 
uh, anti-degradation. So let's, let's go through this really quickly one by one. Water quality standards apply to water bodies. They don't apply to discharges. So when you have a water body, let's say the American River, um, the basin plan uh, for that region, uh, the Central Valley Water Board has assigned the beneficial uses in which the water quality of that uh, river must support. So we're talking uh, municipal domestic water supply, recreation, irrigation, ag, et cetera. And there's a big long list. So those are the beneficial uses. The water quality objectives or the criteria are the narrative or the numeric objectives um, that that water body itself, the quality in that water body must maintain in order to support those uses. Um, so when we have an NPDES permit, um, we take those objectives or criteria and apply it to the discharges that that permit is allowing to take place into that water body. Um, Anti-degradation is an additional consideration by, um, by any water board that is adopting a permit for discharges in which they must consider how much of the assumptive capacity in that water body will they allow discharges to take. So how much will they allow that, um, that pollutant concentration to raise up to the criteria? And when um, a board considers anti-deg, the crux of that consideration is uh, for the social and economic benefit of the people of the state. So I, I, I see a lot of that discussion in the chat. I want to clarify that um, uh, several things. First of all, um, all California toxic rule and all primary and secondary maximum contaminant levels are incorporated into our basin plans either specifically or, um, or by reference. And uh, to think that through though, uh, maximum contaminant levels are for the protection of certain beneficial uses. Um, and so that's how we apply that through permits. Um, and then um, the California toxic rule, uh, rule criteria, that's federal criteria, and that applies to all California water bodies uh, of uh, waters of the United States with specific exceptions that are within um, within that federal rule. So that's kind of a little mini uh, 101. I hope that's helpful, Amy. Yes, thank you. And I briefly lost connection there. So um, okay. thanks for your patience. Sure. <laughs> but that's, that's great. Thank you, Diana. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we covered questions one and maybe two here from Wayne. Um, Wayne, get back to us if we miss something here. Um, Amy, there's one more thing I see in Wayne's comments or questions. Sure. Um, so uh, this draft permit um, applies water quality objectives in several ways. Um, if the NPDES permit states that the discharge must meet the water quality objectives, um, it's important to actually look at the wording of the permit because that could mean that the discharge is not to um, cause or contribute to an exceedance of the water quality objective in the water body, or the permit wording may be that the actual uh, quality of the discharge itself must meet the uh, narrative or numeric water quality objective. Um, so that's two different things. Um, on, um, and I'm sure there's other ways that uh, we word things in the permits um, as we translate just the water quality objectives um, in the basin plans and for stormwater. Okay, great. Thank you, Diana. Um, okay, so question three here is about non visible pollutant monitoring. Um, where it says, uh, in quotations, activities producing pollutants, which pollutants are at issue? Pollutants regulated by an applicable water quality objective or standard, 
pollutants associated with the TMDL or other. Please clarify. Um, we'll have to take a look at that specific language, Wayne. Um, thank you for putting the uh, section number here. Um, it's hard to say without looking at the exact language. Brandon, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, it's essentially we're having our uh, dischargers identify in their pollutant source assessment um, what materials and things that can uh, cause or contribute to an exceedance of a water quality standard, I think. And so um, it mainly depends on what they identify on their site, and that's what they're going to be uh, testing their their uh, their, their stormwater discharges for or their non-stormwater discharges um, if there's been that trigger for the non, uh, non-visible pollutant monitoring. Hopefully that was clear. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think um, this is written really well. And I, my guess is that we'll receive this as a written comment as well. So we can dive a little bit deeper into the specifics. Um, the next clarification needed is on spill, breach, malfunction, or failure, um, which BMPs need to be implemented prior to the next precipitation event. Um, is it the BMPs in the SWIP or something else? Um, so a little clarity on that, it should be the BMPs that are on site. Uh, if there's a spill, breach, malfunction, failure, or leak, uh, it would be the BMPs that are already uh, implemented that could therefore breach, malfunction, fail, or leak. Um, another needs clarification, we will take a look at that. And we're gonna save all of these comments and questions so that we can look at them. Um, but this is not the official, uh, commenting um, hearing. Uh, and so if you can repeat these in a written comment, that would be great, Wayne, thank you. Uh, and then what is meant by and or in provision 1E3? Do we always sample for the analytes in 1E4 plus those identified in 1E3, or is this meant to provide an option for the permittee? Um, we'll have to really take a deep look at that language, Wayne. I'm sorry, it's hard without uh, having it up here on the screen, but um, I can kind of answer that, I think. Yeah. I, I think it's mostly to, um, if there isn't really a analytical method that's uh, indicative of that pollutant source or that pollutant, I guess, in, in your discharge. And so um, we provided indicators uh, such as, you know, pH or uh, um Conductivity, I think, is one of them, or, or uh, you know, other normal water quality uh, assessment um, tools that the discharger can use to say, like, hey, this is not a, a normal level for um, stormwater discharge, and they can say maybe a pollutant has been um, is present within the discharge. Yeah, and thank you, Brandon. He goes on to say, um, please explain how these analytes were selected. Some of them seem duplicative, as you just mentioned, the specific conductance, conductivity, salinity, and total dissolved solids. Um, and Wayne would like us to have supportive findings in the fact sheet for the rationale for those analytes selected. Okay. Okay, moving on to active treatment systems really quick in that uh, attachment. Um, we say the discharger shall assign a lead person or project manager who has either a minimum of five years construction stormwater experience or who is a licensed contractor specifically holding a California Class A contractor's license to oversee operation of the active treatment system. There are not findings to support the conclusion that either a person with five years construction stormwater experience or a California Class A contractor has the necessary training or skills to perform this function, consider requiring a certified wastewater treatment operator. And then there's a link to our operator certification program. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Wayne. I think that's more of a comment uh, for us to consider. And again, um, we'll take a look at that, but also if you would like to submit that as a written comment, um, that goes into the record. And that is actually an existing requirement too. Yeah, that's, that's in the 2009 uh, existing permit. Um, okay, so another comment on active, active treatment systems. Um, the permit, the draft permit says the ATS shall include a filtration step between the coagulant treatment train and the effluent discharge. 
This is commonly provided by sandbag or cartridge filters, which are sized to capture suspended material that might pass through the clarifier tanks. California Water Code prohibits the water board from, this is uh, Wayne's comment, California Water Code prohibits the water board from specifying specific BMPs rather than outcomes. Suggest deleting the following language, and then in quotation marks, this is commonly provided by sandbag or cartridge filters, um, and that's the same language as above. Um, okay, thank you, Wayne. We will take a look at that and run it through Office of Chief Counsel. Um, Appreciate it. Okay, and then Amy, moving on. To this is Diana. Can I just I, add to that? Please, yes. Okay. All right. It's a uh, thank you. That's a, a good comment. And as I look at that, I see that um, what's in quotation is uh, statements. Uh, this is commonly provided by. So uh, maybe that statement would go in the fact sheet, which provides the rationale as. The statement doesn't state that the BMPs must be sandbags, uh, filters, et cetera, um, but we understand what you're saying and we'll, we'll think about relocating that. Thank you, Diana. Okay, next uh, commenter here. Could you please elaborate the discharger shall ensure that the QSP verifies and the particular provision here is photo documentation is included in the stormwater pollution prevention plan for problem areas of erosion, new sediment deposition, authorized non-stormwater discharge, and or field BMPs. So he's asking for us to um, elaborate on the requirement that the QSP verifies these things are in the SWIP. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to elaborate on that. Uh, I mean, I think what we're, we're trying to do here is have the, the qualified SWIP practitioner um, kind of provide that quality assurance in, in the um, inspections that they're performing and to make sure that uh, everything is documented well. So if there's a deficiency of their BMP implementation, then they should have, uh, they should be recording all of that um, and keeping that with the SWIP. Thank you, Brandon. Sound, does that sound right? <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. And if if more clarification is needed, saying please um, reach out either in this chat or via email later. Um, okay. Another question here: Would you please increase the preparation time for the QSP to perform pre-storm monitoring? Seventy-two hours may not be enough for a QSP to inspect multiple sites let's say five sites and prepare the reports for BMP corrective actions. Could you increase it to four or five days? Um, do you wanna answer this one, Brandon? I mean, we can definitely make that consideration. Yeah, and, and I think 72 hours was um, more about the you know, accuracy of the predicted storm event and mm -hmm. a reasonable time to um, you know, not waste your time. If you're five, six days out, um, you may not actually have that storm that's coming. So um, we all know a little bit closer, it gets a little more accurate in terms of uh, predicted storm events, but we will take that into consideration. Thank you, Say. Um, what is the weather forecast trigger for QSP pre-storm inspections? Is it A, 50% or greater chance of precipitation, or B, a uh, half inch of precipitation with a 24 hour period. It should be the forecasted qualifying precipitation event or, for, or forecasted precipitation event. Um, and that's gonna be 50% chance of half an inch within a 24 hour period. Yeah, so it's a combination of both A and B mm -hmm. in that question saying, thank you. Okay, um, and we have a question here from Ken. Given that the stated purpose of the permit is to protect waters of the state and waters of the US, I would like to understand the rationale slash motivation behind the proposed reduction of weekly inspection requirements for risk level one. Human nature shows us that if it is not measured, it won't happen. That said, even with weekly inspections, compliance is at best marginal, marginal and removing 75% of the inspection requirements will, in my opinion, completely compromise permit compliance. The marginal compliance performance by contractors is typically not due to SWIP design flaws, 
or inadequate qualified SWIP practitioner inspections, but lack of real enforcement by the uh, municipal separate storm sewer system and or the regional water quality control board. Most QSPs, if polled, would, say, would state that they often feel like chicken little crying out, the sky is falling because there is little in the way of official follow-up. I would suggest that eliminating weekly inspections for risk level one sites would completely undermine the objective of the CGP and would compromise the objectives of the permit. Um, that's a great comment. Ken, thank you so much. Um, I also like your analogy of chicken little, mm -hmm. uh, a story we all know <laughs> from childhood. Um, we have had similar comments yesterday as well on the weekly inspections for risk level one sites. Um, and that is something that we will take into consideration uh, before the final draft. Um, I hear your concern that it removes a lot of the um, responsibility and um, the word that I'm searching for that I can't find. Uh, but we will take a look at that. Thank you, Ken. And then he uh, goes on to add the federal CGP requires weekly and or biweekly inspections for all projects greater than an acre. In practical terms, this model will compromise the viability of the QSP program. Thank you, Ken. Uh, again, we will take a look at that and um, take your comments into consideration. Um, and then we have someone uh, agreeing with Ken's comment here and says the proposed new standards are less than the federal CGP, wherein it states that a state can require stricter standards, but not lesser standards. Um, we will definitely take a look at that as well. Okay. Um, now a comment question about QSD periodic site audits. Um, I completely agree with the idea that QSDs, that's qualified SWIP developers, must be responsive to changing project site needs. Given the dynamic nature of any construction project, the site is constantly changing and BMPs are routinely compromised. If weekly inspections at a minimum are not occurring, how can some semblance of compliance be expected? The best people to provide accurate feedback to a QSD is a well-trained qualified SWIP practitioner that has the skills and knowledge to recognize a non-compliant or ineffective BMP. Making the qualified SWIP developers scapegoats for sites for site non-compliance is a bridge too far if contractors and owners lack the motiv motivation because of lack of enforcement. So that's more of a, a comment. Thank you, Ken. Um, I think the main comment here is that um, there needs to be better communication between the qualified SWIP practitioner and qualified SWIP developer, and that with a lack of enforcement, the qualified SWIP developer becomes more liable. So um, that's a good comment. Thank you, Ken. Uh, we will take that into consideration as well. Um, certainly, we don't mean to um, put anybody, you know, in a, in a place of more liability. We do want to make sure that the qualified SWIP developer is um, aware of what's happening on the site and that they're able to implement the plan that they so diligently worked on uh, ahead of the site's activity. Okay, we have a question about uh, linear utilities. Um, can you provide additional information to the linear utility project coverage segment and area wide? One, will the segments need a LCAN and LCTN, mm -hmm. which I forget what those acronyms are, Brandon, if you can. Uh, a linear construction activity notification is the LCAN, and then uh, linear construction, what, what, what was, is LC? TN? TN, uh, okay. termination notice. Okay. So will the segments need those two documents? And this is um, notifying the state board that they plan on starting activity for a segment and then closure of that segment. Mm -hmm. um, so with area-wide permitting, uh, essentially the uh, linear linear underground overhead project um, or the, the, the discharger um, can file a single 
uh, notice of intent for coverage of the entire regional water board um, for like uh, or, or similar projects. So they're going to be the same. Uh, I believe, I think it was type one um, that we put in there. Yes. Uh, and they have to be of similar scope. So, you know, all gas transmission, all um, electrical transmission. And then uh, within that WDID, that's going to continue for the duration of the permit, unless they decide to terminate it for whatever reason, say the program ends or they don't need to, they're finding that it's not working for them. Um, they can add different sites to that WDID um, via the, uh, I believe it's the LCAN, so the Linear Construction Activity Notice or Notification. Um, and they can remove that site once it's done uh, using the Linear Construction Termination Notice Notification. Great. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what is the approach to limiting the area-wide permitting to just type one? Um, I think what we're, we're thinking there is that those are lower risk projects and that uh, having those all within a scope um, would be more protective of water quality. Did you want to expand on that? Um, yeah, we wanted to allow for flexibility and for uh, ease of use. Um, for these linear projects, um, we found that this would be most helpful for the uh, type one projects where they can have uh, a similar scope and um, a little bit less oversight because they are type one. Um, okay, and then third, he says, area-wide LUPs will need a new and updated SWIP. Have you considered having each specific site include a figure and specific BMPs as an attachment to the original SWIP. I'm not exactly sure what the question is here, but for area-wide permitting, uh, we allow for the general SWIP and then each segment or each you know uh, site under that area-wide permit needs to have site-specific SWIP. Mm -hmm. And that would include the uh, specific BMPs. And the, and the site map as well. And so, yeah, I'm, I think that's what you mean by figure, but yeah, the site map and any uh, water pollution control drawings. Uh, Amy and Brandon, this is Diana. Um, when I look at this comment, um, and this may be true or not, but what I'm reading is um, what can be done so we don't have to rewrite our SWIP, our existing SWIPs. Um, is there a way that they can more easily like append information and so forth. Yeah, and that's that's what I was talking about in terms of the site specific SWIP. Um, the utility companies typically uh, will have, you know, a large SWIP covering the whole area or the, the large multi, you know, mile project that they have. And mm -hmm. then uh, a site specific SWIP for each segment. Um, so that's what we were trying to get at, but we will definitely take a look at the language and make sure that that um, says what we want it to say. <laughs> okay, thank you, Diana. Um, order section 3C, 1 and 2, um, coverage under the previous permit states that all existing notices of intent will be terminated at the effective date of the permit. Dischargers must recertify and submit updated permit registration documents for coverage under the new permit. Are new permit fees required at this time? And will a new WDID be issued? So yesterday we had the same question. We termed it fees and WDIDs and decided it was going to be Brandon's uh, memoir title. <laughs> um, so <laughs> there will not be a new fee required when you recertify. You will remain on your billing cycle for your annual fee and you will not have a new WDID. It will be the same WDID number. You just have to recertify. Maybe instead of my memoir, I could be my mixtape. Uh... Your mixtape, there you go, <laughs> your LP. Um, so it looks like maybe this is a spelling error. What does the water board mean by numeric? Uh, I think we mean numeric. Um, <laughs> So we will take a look at that language if it's a spelling error, spelling error, but it should read 
uh, may be translated into general permit requirements and TMDL specific numeric action levels and numeric effluent limitations. All right, next one, attachment C2, C3, daily visual inspections. Uh, daily visual inspections are now defined to be conducted for each subsequent 24 hour period with at least 0.25 inches of rain. Question one, if a half inch of rain is established on day one of the storm, is a daily required? And two, if on subsequent days, a quarter of an inch is not reached until after business hours, or discharger, are dischargers exempt from the daily inspection or is the intent to perform the inspection on the following day? So I'll go back and give you question one, Brandon. If half inch of rain is established on day one of the storm, is a daily inspection required? I believe yes, it would be. And then if on a subsequent day, there's a quarter inch of rain and it's not reached until after business hours, are the dischargers exempt from the daily inspection? or is the intent to perform the inspection on the following day? Mm, that's a little trickier. Um, well, we only require inspections to be performed during uh, site operating hours. And so I would say if they, and we might have to make a clarification in the permit, um, that if it reaches that uh, quarter inch subsequent day threshold, um, the next day might be appropriate to, to do your inspection, but we'll have to think that one out a little bit. And um, if you have a specific scenario in mind, mm -hmm. um, please email us and let us know so that we yeah. can clarify this. There was some discussion yesterday of maybe uh, looking at what was forecasted for that day. So um, we'll have to figure out that one a little bit more. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Diana. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if Doug Cardian um, not only was pointing out a misspelling, but if he was actually asking um, about what we mean um, when we are referring to the word numeric. Many TMDLs and water quality control plans include implementation requirements that may be translated into permit requirements um, and numeric action levels and uh, numeric effluent limitations. So just in case, Doug, if you did mean to ask this question, we might as well cover it. Mm -hmm. um, so what we mean when we make that statement um, about the TMDLs in the basin plans, in the regional board basin plans, um, or in a statewide water quality control plan is that the total maximum daily load regulations um, many times are not written um, specifically for stormwater discharges. In fact, many times we'll look at TMDLs and they're written more so for uh, the continuous type discharges, continuous flow and so forth. Um, so water board staff in developing an NPDES permit such as this one must go into the TMDL, um, look how it is written and translate, um, translate it, work with the regional board staff um, on what was the intention of the TMDL and, um, and the additional TMDL related requirements that you see in this draft permit is when our staff translation of that TMDL shows that we need a numeric action level, which is a numeric trigger that triggers more um, BMP attention or more um, pollutant control attention, or if it's necessary to implement that TMDL with an actual numeric effluent limitation because that's how the TMDL is written. So, um, so just in case you had that additional question, um, I'm just providing this extra information. Um, and Amy and Brandon, please uh, correct anything I may have said that doesn't apply specifically to the CGP. Thank you, Diane. Okay, 
So um, we had another comment question here from Doug about uh, when um, the construction permit must be secured prior to the site activity. Um, it's a little difficult to read, Doug, uh, the formatting in the exhibit for two where you uh, copied it into the chat. I'm, I'm really not understanding what the question is. So if you could either um, restate the question or reach out to me via email, um, that would be ideal and we'll answer that for you. Okay, so the next one is um, maintenance and repair states that dischargers shall maintain, repair, or implement design changes to BMPs within 72 hours of identification of failures. Is the intent for repairs to be complete or just to have begun within 72 hours? Um, I'd say by, I guess it, that language could be a little bit more clear. Um, because, I mean, I would say within 72 hours might be difficult depending on what they're trying to implement. So I would read that as uh, has at least begun within 72 hours. Okay, great. Thank you. And we can make that um, okay. clarification, Andrew. And then under uh, section H, terminating permit coverage, um, the regional water board will consider a site parcel or individual lot complete only when all portions of the site comply with all of the following conditions. And then it goes on to read, the conditions here routinely create conflict. Specifically, most built homes are sold with bare dirt around the house, allowing the homeowner to install their preferred landscape. Routinely, developers are being required to install permanent, albeit conceptually temporary landscape materials, i.e. sod, this creates considerable waste and additional durations of disturbed soil areas when the homeowner shortly after the temporary landscape is put in, then has a landscaper remove it and put it in the property owner's desired landscape. Um, this is a comment we've heard previously, Doug, thank you. Um, I think that there's a better way for us to address this um, now that we've heard this comment. Um, the concept here is that there are some very large um, subdivisions that are built where if they do not landscape the yards, um, it creates quite a bit of erodible material. And um, we have witnessed in some regions uh, this causing a, a large problem for water quality. And so um, we have not hit the magical fix, I think, in this language. So we will take a look at that again as well. Okay. Um, and then it looks like uh, we, I'm being told that we skipped Wayne's comment too. I think that we brought it in together um, with comment one on the uh, water quality objectives and receiving water limitations. Um, this is the fact sheet and the question is, dischargers can determine the applicability, the applicable water quality standards by contacting regional water board staff or by consulting one of the following sources. The actual basin plans that contain the water quality standards can be viewed at the website of the appropriate regional water board, the state water board site for statewide plans and the US EPA regulations for the national toxic rule and California toxics rule. Basin plans and statewide plans are also available by mail from the appropriate regional water board or the state water board. The US EPA regulations are available on their website. And then the comment is, Neither the permit nor the reference materials provided the regional water board staff with any guidance regarding how to determine which water quality objectives or standards are applicable to stormwater discharges. Moreover, neither the permit nor the reference materials provides any guidance on how or where to sample. Uh, Amy, this is Diana. Would you like me to um, respond to that? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, so the uh, the regional board staff um, know their basin plan quite well. And um, the NPDES permit is not to instruct the regional board staff on how to um, 
on how to determine which objectives apply. Um, this is why it's very important for dischargers um, if they're not familiar with their water bodies or with the regulations, or even if they are, uh, to work closely with the regional board staff. The regional board staff will be able to um, confirm what the water quality objectives are uh, for your specific receiving water body. Um, they will be able to assist you in any way to, um, to comply with the permit. And also our regional board staff are in close communication with our state board staff for any specific um, questions about uh, certain permit apl uh, requirement applicability for that uh, specific water body. Um, therefore, uh, we put a lot of trust in our regional board staff and we work really closely with them. If any discharger ever has questions about what are the water quality objectives that apply to them or um, need any assistance in compliance uh, with their specific project. Uh, we highly suggest that you reach out to your regional board staff or to uh, state board staff and we will provide that assistance. Thank you, Diana. Um, so I think we'll do Another question here and then take a 10 minute break. Um, so I will answer Tanya Bilizikian's question and then we will start back up 10, min 10 minutes after that. So I'll let you know what time here in a minute. Um, so order section 3B3 no longer allows linear utility projects to be segmented based on topography as in the 2009 <laughs> Sounds like all of his uh, got someone's attention. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, yeah. all of has to make herself known. I apologize. Challenges of working in a pandemic. Um, so uh, this was a valuable tool to reduce requirements in lower risk areas while focusing on steeper areas. Can you comment on why this has been removed? Um. I would have to take a little bit more look at that, Tanya, um, and then I can get back to you on that. I'm not exactly sure why that has been removed. Okay, thank you, Brandon. We have one last one here from Tanya. Um, can you discuss the requirement to submit a notice of termination map with final elevation contours? Not every site produces as-built drawings and this requirement could trigger the need for post-construction to topographic survey, adding tens of thousands of dollars or more depending on project site to project cost. This was something that uh, the regional water boards had asked for. And um, in order to uh, process the, uh, the notices of terminations within a, a faster time period. Um, so we included that, uh, but we do recognize now that that could be uh, potentially costly to, uh, to our dischargers. And so we'll take a look at that requirement. Okay, great. Um, it's 9.58. That seems like a good time for a break, if that's okay with everyone here. Um, and we can come back at 10.10. Um, we will take a moment to put up a break slide here with that uh, return time. So if everyone could come back at 10 after 10, that would be great. Thank you.
All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you so much for allowing that short break. Um, it was highly needed. Uh, okay, great. So if it's okay with everyone, we will jump back into answering some questions. Um, uh, Brandon, I will start here with Anne's question. Are the exemptions slash exceptions from the surface water buffer requirement in the federal permit included in the CBP? Um, and then in parentheses, construction approved under a uh, Clean Water Act 404 permit, water dependent structures, et cetera. From what I recall, that language is not in our risk level attachments, um, but it's definitely something that we're gonna consider um, adding. I think it was included in a, uh, an attachment of the federal construction general permit. Um, by reference, and so we may have missed it. Okay, next question from Tanya. For projects with a duration um, that will span both permits, will there be a grandfathering opportunity as in the 2009 permit? Some projects, particularly those owned by a public agency, do not have the ability to turn on a dime or add funding to address midstream regulatory changes. Um, that's a great question. Tanya, um, we've had that comment from several folks, including Caltrans. So we are going to take a look at how we can uh, make that work in the most practical way. We understand that there are some uh, funding issues, particularly with public projects through either a municipality or like Caltrans. So we will take a look at that. Um, and then she adds to Andrew, Andrew's Russell 2 question. Did I skip Andrew's Russell 2 question? I did. I'm sorry. Uh, Andrew, <laughs> will Russell 2 standards be developed and included into the permit? There is much subjectivity in this calculation and not a widely available slash comprehensive program to appropriately model all scenarios. Regional board interpretations also vary widely. And then I'll throw um, Tanya's add on to that as well. Will the State Water Board develop a standard version of the Russell 2 program, a broad version with a lot of BMPs to choose from and with standardized reporting would be very helpful. Thank you, Tanya. Um, okay, so to answer Andrew's question, uh, will standards be developed and included into the permit? Um, guidance will be developed. I don't know if we'll necessarily consider them as standards, um, but something that we'll heavily rely upon. Um, State Water Board staff plan on working with the construction subcommittee at uh, CASQA, the California Stormwater Quality Association, um, to develop uh, additional guidance regarding the use of Russell II. Thank you. Oh, and we've got a, a clarification. Thank you so much, Doug. Um, he says that numeric with a B is a new term within the pharmacology industry. Mm -hmm. And that's why he was asking. A numeric with a B criteria is a high standard at any level. That's yeah. something new. I've never heard good, that before. Thank good, you good so much, that. Doug. Uh, we will make sure not to use that, <laughs> that word. And that explains why it may have passed our spell check. Um, so I think that was just an error. Thank you. Um, and then going back to Tanya's question about developing a, a, a state Russell II program, um, it's something that we've certainly thought about, um, but we would have to uh, definitely reach out for some additional expertise with, uh, you know, developing such a program. So um, we'll, we'll let you guys know if that's a future endeavor of ours. Thank you, Brandon. Um, and then uh, Chris clarified he was wanting to go back to Wayne's question, uh, comment two on the active treatment systems, not on the water quality objectives. So um, the comment says the active treatment system shall be designed by a certified professional in erosion and sediment control, a certified professional in, in stormwater quality, or a California licensed professional civil engineer. The design of the ATS system involves engineering as defined by the California Business and Professions Code. This work can only be done by licensed California PE. Um, thank you, Chris, for uh, bringing that back up. 
and we will take a look at that. Um, we certainly don't want to, I believe there's a statement elsewhere in the permit that says all engineering work needs to be done by a licensed engineer, but we will make sure that that's clear in the active treatment system uh, attachment. And that, that licensed contractor part might be referring to like the operation of the system. Um, so we'll, we'll look into that more. Okay. And then um, we have a comment here on a frequently asked question, which is the common plane of development or sale. Um, an overbroad interpretation of the term would render meaningless the clear one acre federal permitting threshold and would potentially trigger permitting of almost any construction activity that occurs within an area that had previously received area wide utility or road improvements. So here's the question. Can you clarify how this statement can be interpreted in the field? Would a concrete pad removal and subsurface trenching with a minimal footprint be required to have a SWIP? It is not uncommon for utility LUP projects to need uh, to need to demolish a pad under one acre. Understanding that projects cannot be broken up, have you considered de minimis area for coverage? <clears throat> so um, the common plan of development is a federal definition that we use. Um, we may have added to it a little bit. Um, this can be a tricky situation. Um, it is very site specific. Um, if you have a scenario like this where you need to demolish a pad under one acre, um, I would say please reach out to your regional water board um, to discuss whether that would be part of the larger common plan or not. It's very, very site specific. Um, frequently in the Fresno area, we may have you know, um, areas where they're doing some oil and gas work and it's very spotty and, um, you know, it can be closer to another uh, site or further and it just really depends. And so the regional water board is very adept at um, making those site specific determinations. And, and one of the thresholds that we kind of use for determining if something's a larger common plan of development is if that, um, that smaller site is greater than a quarter acre um, from the, the main site, I guess you could say. A quarter mile. A qu yeah, sorry, a quarter mile. <laughs> um, and so that's something to factor into as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then question two, linear utility projects often have long duration schedules and thus excluded from the erosivity waiver. However, most of the site or segments fall under a low R value in non-rain seasons. Have you considered the option of having the QSD reevaluate the open, I'm sorry, evaluate the open disturbed acreage, size of site project, R value and duration for a site specific project and have QSD approve or exclude specific projects? Um, no, we have not considered that. Uh, we feel pretty strongly that the risk level should be calculated um, for the entire project, not um, segments of it. Um, and the best way to address this is by not, you know, mass grading and just doing bits at a time. Um, but we can certainly discuss that. And if you have a site specific scenario that you'd like to chat about, um, please feel free to email us. Okay, so we have a question from Susan here. Hi, Susan, good to see your name. Um, regarding the sufficiently sensitive test method requirement, some of the TMDL related permit requirements are derived from the California Toxics Rule criteria, and there may not be test methods capable of detecting pollutants at the numeric effluent limitation level. For example, subpart per trillion levels for PCBs. Do the minimum level requirements of the SIP apply in these cases? Will a permitted be in non-compliance if a sufficiently sensitive test method does not exist? And uh, it, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. No, I, I didn't know there's more to it. Um, I was just gonna say if Diana or OCC could chime in, that would be great. Hmm. Sure, absolutely. Um, that's a good question. 
Susan, because um, we have worked with our ELAP staff. Uh, ELAP is the Environmental Laboratory Accreditation Program. Um, and we discuss the minimum levels that are in the state implementation plan in Appendices 4, and that many of those minimum levels are outdated. Um, so with that, we would have to have further discussion um, with our ELAP staff for specific pollutants or specific criteria and what is the uh, ELAP requirements or expectations of laboratories um, to be able to perform those analysis down to the level of either um, the numeric permit requirement or the uh, water quality criteria. Um, with that, I just want to make a note that um, in talking with uh, the ELAP managers, um, we, we confirm that as staff and as the board, uh, we don't want the capability, the current capability of laboratories to dictate what the regulations are. Um, we want the regulations to dictate how the laboratories uh, need to further progress to make sure that they um, develop and implement the analysis and they get the appropriate equipment necessary to meet the regulations. So I know we're kind of in this middle gray area for some of these analyses. Um, however, for the requirements um, for this federal rule, we are implementing it and we will probably need to pull an ELAP um, and their staff expertise for any specific circumstances in which we find that laboratories cannot um, measure that far down. Um, so to sum that up in general, uh, we should not be hanging our hat on the minimum levels of the state implementation plan um, because some of those are outdated. Thank you. I, I believe for the, the one or the uh, total maximum daily loads that have those numeric effluent limitations and numeric action levels that are, um, and, you know, like parts per trillion, uh, we have included uh, in attachment H, I want to say, that the discharger should contact the regional water board um, staff to uh, determine a potential uh, alternative monitoring requirement for those. Great, thank you, Brandon. Um, and then we have another comment here. Uh, the CGP's bottom line is water quality and compliance with the CGP. This new permit has removed such items as REAPs and weekly inspections for risk level one and changed QSP inspections for risk level two and three to monitor as opposed to weekly, monthly as opposed to weekly. I understand that it gives the QSP the option to train a delegate, but that delegate will most likely be an employee of the same company that holds the risk of creating a uh, numeric action level discharge. I feel this creates a grade your own homework type of situation. A better approach would be to require a third party qualified representative that is ethically tied to the CGP through the certification process to be on site weekly to constantly monitor, man, monitor, manage, and educate the contractors and owners through this process. In terms of the REAP, this is a great document that gives almost instant notification of a 50% chance of precipitation and bridges the gap between having to get to the half inch before an inspection essentially giving the site a change of a chance of being protected for any amount of rain. Um, thank you for that comment, Kevin. Um, we will look at the risk level one weekly inspections that's been mentioned a few times before. Um, and again, if you have uh, specific thoughts on this um, or would like to chat about it, um, please reach out to us via email. Um, Overwhelmingly, we've heard that the REAP is not effective and helpful um, in the existing permit, but I would love to hear your experience. Um, okay, and then Sang is uh, clarifying a previous question. Um, my previous question regarding the photo documentation included in the SWIP for problem areas of erosion, new sediment deposition, unauthorized non-stormwater discharges, and or field BMPs. 
I think you meant SWIP amendments when SWIP submitted with the NOI and SMARTS at the first time could not have the photos of problem areas. Am I right? Yes. So that would be part of the uh, an amendment to the SWIP. Um, okay. A comment and question here from Ken. Uh, realizing that currently the LRP is in on the hook for permit compliance, is there no language that can be incorporated into the permit to hold contractors accountable for failure to inform the legally responsible person of their obligations under the permit? As an example, as a qualified SWIP developer, I design a stormwater pollution prevention plan for a civil engineer on behalf of the legally responsible person. The project is permitted, but the LRP, although informed of the inspection protocols during the permit filing, relies on the contractor to understand and implement state permit requirements. Can contractors, as part of their duty to inform, be held accountable for failure to ensure compliance on behalf of their client, uh, the LRP? For example, fail to employ a qualified SWIP practitioner or hire a third-party service. Based on 10 plus years of annual re report input, it is by it has been my experience that a certain class of contractor, no names, have a tendency to not keep their LRP informed of requirements, usually to control budget. The result is a complete breakdown in the inspection protocols. Um, that's a great comment, Ken. I think that um, in terms of duty to inform and accountability and the permit, um, it gets pretty hairy there. Um, we have incorporated some language in terms of the qualified SWIP developer and qualified SWIP practitioner um, and how we can um, question their um, licensing, their certification as a QSD, QSP through CASQA. Um, this is kind of a difficult one that, that maybe we need to run through our Office of Enforcement. Um, but again, we will take these comments and, and work through them. Ken, you and I know each other pretty well, so we can talk offline about this as well. Um, and if you want to clarify here in the chat, we can come back to it as well. Okay, can we discuss the requirements for sampling at rain events? Are you following the industrial general permit model and making it so that sampling is required within two hours of discharge? Um, I think that was our, uh, one of our goals was to have um, discharge sampled uh, within, you know, as frequently, or I guess within a reasonable amount of time. Um, we did change it it used to say uh, in the preliminary staff draft, and I, we actually didn't touch upon that in our workshop today, that it was that there was supposed to be a two hour um, interval between samples taken at a discharge location. And we actually reduced that to 15 minutes, um, uh, a 15 minute interval. So you take essentially uh, three samples within 30 minutes. So zero, 15 and 30. Um, but I believe the requirements say that discharges are supposed to be uh or discharges are supposed to be sampled within two hours of uh, observation of them i guess which includes um like your planned site operating hours mm -hmm. yeah yeah so so say you know a, a site starts discharging before site operating hours once you come on the site and you notice that it's discharging that would be you would have two hours from then to uh, sample thank you um, okay, and then Arnold has a question here. Qualifying precipitation events are extended for each subsequent 24 hour period resulting in at least a quarter inch of precipitation. And that's in quotation marks. And then again, daily precipitation event visual inspections are not required on days that result in less than 0 .20, 0 0.25 inches of, of precipitation. Can you clarify the daily during storm visual inspection requirement? Is the quarter inch of precipitation based on actual or NOAA predicted rainfall. If the quarter inch rainfall is recorded an hour before the end of business day, it does not provide much time for an inspector to travel to a site and conduct a daily precipitation event inspection. And I think we've gotten a question like this a little bit earlier in the workshop. Um, we'll definitely have to look at that to see how it makes sense. It might, 
make more sense to have that daily inspection um, if there is a predicted uh, quarter of an inch of precipitation. Um, that way the inspection can happen during the day. Um, or we, we might consider saying that if you know that quarter of an inch is achieved uh, after site operating hours, then the, the inspection would occur the next day. Great, thank you. Okay, we have a question about the uh, notice of non-applicability or NOMA. Um, the new permit language Im includes a section dealing with notice of non-applicability. Water code section 13399.30 sets forth the authority for water board to provide entities referring to the person. A process for determining this general permit does not apply to the entity's activities through a notice of non-applicability or NONA. The addition of the NONA provisions in this general permit addresses the determination process and required information for construction sites situated in areas where stormwater discharges to waters that are not hydrologically connected to waters of the United States. Can you provide an example of a site or some clarification in the fact sheet for sites that may qualify other than disconnected? Like the industrial general permit, will securing the status require work slash documentation by a licensed engineer. So the construction permit is different from the industrial permit in many ways. Um, this is one of them. In the industrial general permit, there's an option to obtain a NONA through um, a no discharge technical report, which essentially is a uh, report signed and stamped by a licensed professional engineer that says that there is no um, ability for the site to discharge. And that is based on continuous modeling. Um, and because in the industrial general permit generally applies to facilities that are static in nature, they don't change over time and they don't move around. Um, that is a clear option for industrial facilities that say they want to um, you know, put their entire site in a basin that could never discharge water. Um, for construction, it's a little bit different. And so we're specifically addressing sites that are hydrologically disconnected from waters of the United States. Um, an example would be, and this is just a hypothetical, I'm not saying that this is one, but if there was a site in the Lancaster Palmdale area, and it was determined that that site could not discharge to waters of the United States because it's hydrologically disconnected, then that would qualify for the NONA. Um, okay. I haven't had a chance to look through all 16.3 um, megabytes of the draft yet. I like that we're measuring it in megabytes and not pages. Um, <laughs> that's a new millennium way to do it. I like it. Um, is the draft permit going to allow for sites to be considered non-contiguous if all separate sites are less than an acre each and are greater than a quarter mile apart? For example, for example, on culvert projects with less than one acre disturbed soil area at each site and are far greater than 0.25 acres apart. I think she means miles, yes. but there can be 100 culverts in one project. That sounds like a, a Caltrans comment. It is a Caltrans comment. Okay. Um, I mean, if they're greater than one, one fourth mile um, apart and they're all less than an acre, I, I would say that those don't need to be considered as a larger common plan of development. But we can perhaps. Uh, provide that scenario in the fact sheet somewhere. Great, thank you, Brandon. Okay, we have a question here about PFAS and I don't think I'm gonna get the acronym right, but it's perfluoral alcohol substances. Um, it's contaminants that we are, uh, I would say they're emergent, of, emergent, of emerging concern. Mm -hmm. um, Wayne asks, sufficiently sensitive test methods will likely implicate PFAS if the state adopts minimum contaminant, maximum contaminant levels for PFAS, which will then be incorporated as water quality objectives in the basin plan, assuming that MCLs are applicable water quality objectives. 
Currently, there is no approved test method for PFAS in stormwater. How should a discharger address this issue? Amy, this is Diana. Would you like me to um, respond to this? Yes, please. Okay. Um, while any regulation is under development is the perfect time. In fact, it is the time that these type of issues uh, should be addressed. And so as uh, the PFOS issue is, uh, we have a lot of staff resources addressing the PFOS issues. There's a lot of coordination with other agencies and other interested parties. Um, it is important that interested parties speak up um, if there is not an implementation plan. Uh, but I would assume as our state water board staff um, are dealing with this uh, issue and as the state water board proceeds in developing <clears throat> regulation for PFOS that this would be addressed. Um, regardless, um, when there is new regulation such as uh, uh, maximum contaminant level for PFOS, that will, um, that will be implemented through various permitting programs. Um, so right now, as the CGP is going forward to um, be adopted, um, if we do not yet have adopted MCLs for PFOS or any other constituents, we would not be looking into that specifically now through the CGP. Um, we will, however, as stormwater regulatory staff, um, be involved with our policy development staff um, for PFOS and with other TMDL development and other regu regulation development on what does that mean for the regulation and permitting of stormwater. So, um, so to answer your comment and your question, um, now is the time while that regulation is being developed to, um, to make sure that water board staff are considering how this uh, proposed regulation and MCLs will be implemented throughout different permitting programs. Great, thank you. Okay, um, moving right along here. Can you clarify training requirements as related to samplers? Often we receive SWIPs stating that one, QSP certification is sufficient training, and that two, the QSP with no specific sampling training can train QSP designees. Um, so I guess I can talk a little bit about the broader uh, QSD and QSP training program. Um, the state water board staff, regional water board staff, uh, CASQA and um, Office of Water Programs are part of the Construction General Permit Training Team. Um, and, and as part of that training team, we try to identify how to develop our QSD and QSP training program. Um, and so in that, we'll be looking at uh, what we want our qualified stormwater professionals to um, really be focusing on during their certification trainings. Um, and so in there, we might uh, consider training on how to take uh, appropriate samples. Um, additionally, we uh, have included within the uh, the delegation ability of a qualified SWIP practitioner that they will have to be adhering to a training outline that is provided by the uh, Construction General Permit Training Team. And, um, that outline has not been developed yet, but it is in the works. Um, and in doing so, that should address making sure that those uh, delegated professionals are receiving some sort of standardized training from their qualified SWIP practitioners, um, albeit they'll, they'll want to include something site specific in that training as well um, to make sure that everything is addressed uh, for that particular site and for those particular staff. And so um, we've heard this as a concern and uh, we've definitely recognized that Delegated stormwater or dele, delegated site staff um, remain a uh, oftentimes remain a link or a, a missing link, I guess you could say, or uh, part of the chain of stormwater compliance where errors can um, occur more frequently. And so we're trying to address that by increasing those training um, 
and, and standardizing it a little bit. Thank you, Brandon. Mm -hmm. Okay, and from Alice here, in draft attachment B, section F, risk level determination, it states that the construction start date begins with initial disturbance to land, including disturbances under previous land owners. Does this include farmland roads? How far back does the initial disturbance need to be researched? Months, years, decades? Please clarify the requirement. Thank you. That's a great comment. Um, that was really in, intent on uh, sites that were previously covered under the construction stormwater general permit. So I would say that the if the uh, the farmland roads were um, constructed not under coverage with this construction stormwater general permit, say it's part of their um, irrigated lands permit or, or something, uh, then they would not need to factor that into the, the initial disturbance. What we're trying to get at here is like say, uh, we have one developer come in and grade, and then uh, that property is sold to um, another developer to do vertical construction. And so uh, the initial disturbance date would go back to that initial grading or whatever the first uh, land disturbance was for the project. I hope that makes it clear. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Or another example would be like uh, doing utilities for you know a subdivision. So that's technically a, a land disturbance that's occurring for that project, um, and it was you know occurred previously, and maybe someone else was um, responsible for that, and then that uh, the land then transferred to a new owner who has to get separate coverage, and so that new owner has to um, use the original start date for the entire project. Great, thank you, Brandon. Mm -hmm. Um, we have the biggest question, I think, in the nation right now, which is, well, for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, who determines what is a waters of the U.S.? Um, that's a great question, Debbie. I think from my perspective uh, right now, it could be Congress, could be Supreme Court. Um, Diana, do you want to jump in on this? Absolutely. And so, um, Amy, I you are just, um, you're, you're always starting a thing way at the top. Absolutely. It's, it's Congress, it's the Supreme Court and so forth. I'm going to pull it down to our level um, as how does a discharger determine if they're receiving water is a water of the United States? Um, yes, this is a difficult question and um, we always have the dischargers work with their regional board staff as the regional board staff um, are able to work with their, um, their attorneys and come to a determination on if a specific receiving water is a water of the United States. Um, but back and back to what Amy was saying, I just saw an article this morning talking about how there's revisiting of the water of the United States with the current federal administration. Um, so that is always a changing regulation that no one can get their arms around. Um, with the exception, Diana, yes, and Serena will go. But with the exception that you do need to be talking about specific water bodies as we go further into uh, looking if it's a water of the US. And Serena Louis is one of our attorneys and it's perfect that she's popping in to answer this question. Thanks, Diana. And the only thing I was gonna add was a little bit more information on what's happening on the federal level. So as you mentioned, you that you're going to be in um, Serena, we can't quite hear you. Can you get a little closer to your mic? Okay. Is this a little bit better? Much better. Okay. So they just announced that they will be revisiting. Sorry, I'm hearing an echo. You're okay. We can hear you fine. Okay. Um, they'll be revisiting the 2020 Navigable Waters Protection Rule. Um, that will take some time before a is either repealed and or they replace it with a different definition. 
But I think the important takeaway for people who are looking at how does the waters of the US rule affect the NONA applications, the notice of non applicability. For notice of non applicability, you have to be completely hydrologically disconnected from any water of the US. So it's insufficient to say well, the nearest water body that I'm closest to is not a water of the US, so I qualify. That doesn't mean you're hydrologically disconnected from any water of the US. So a lot of the uncertainty regarding federal jurisdiction is on these marginal cases. And, um, and those changes are unlikely to make huge shifts and whether entire basins are not connected. So in Amy's example of the Lancaster Palmdale area, that area is hydrologically disconnected under the 2020 rule and the rule prior to that. Okay, great. Thank you, Serena. You were, it was a little bit hard to hear you there for a little bit, but my understanding is that you were saying that it's unlikely new decisions would affect this particular permitting program and its applicability to the notice of non-applicability. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I heard Serena say. Okay, great. Thank you. Sorry, that took me a while. Yes, that's a good summary. Okay, thank you, Serena. I appreciate you hopping on. Um, okay, and then another comment about QSD, QSP um, interactions with the, with the legally responsible person. Um, currently, the contractor is only held accountable directly for gross pollutant negligence. The permit has relied on the contractual language between the legally responsible person and the contractor. For example, the, the LRP is fined and that fine rolls downhill to the contractor in the form of back charges. I think contractors should be held directly accountable for failing to inform the legally responsible person of their permit obligations, either because of ignorance or conscious omission. I have two projects this week alone that have this scenario and they want an annual report and notice of termination filed. Um, yeah, Ken, that's a, a challenging issue between contractor and a uh, legally responsible person. Um, we have added some language about the legally responsible person. Um, I would also go back to the certification statement that every legally responsible person or duly authorized representative signs when they um, certify anything in SMARTS, and that puts that um, obligation onto them. If you have specific language um, that you're interested in seeing that would resolve this issue, Ken, reach out to me. You know where to find me, um, and we can discuss it. Um, okay. The EPA definition of non-contiguous should be considered for inclusion in this permit. It's quarter mile apart, less than one acre each, no CGP recover coverage is required. And that's a uh, Caltrans question, I think, going back to the previous question about contiguous sites. So we will take a look at that EPA uh, definition, Mel, thank you. Um, and then Wayne just notes that you can get a Waters of the US determination from the Army Corps based on current rules. Um, and as Serena was saying, those rules could change, um, but Army Corps of Engineers uh, has made some of those jurisdictional determinations in the past from my understanding. Um, okay, related to risk level determination, when a project goes into inactive status, the site must be stabilized. When status is reactivated, is the period of inactivity factored into the new erosivity factor or deleted from the calculation, and what is the rationale for this? Um, I want to say that we are not. Can you can you repeat the question one more time? I want to make sure I phrase it right. Sure. Um, when status is reactivated, is the period of inactivity factored into the new erosivity factor, mm -hmm. or deleted from the calculation? And what is the rationale for this? Um, we would say that the R factor should be calculated from the beginning of the project through the end, the anticipated end of the project. Um, I guess we, so that would mean that the R factor would be for the entire duration, including the inactive period. Correct. That's, yeah, you yeah. would not reevaluate the risk 
when you come out of inactivity mm -hmm. back into activity? Um, that said, if you're, you're thinking of having a project that is going to be inactive for, you know, like a year or more, um, you might want to just consider terminating coverage at that point and then um, final stabilizing your site and then uh, reapplying for coverage when uh, the uh, under the construction general permit uh, when construction activities will resume. So yeah, we have, we have that inactivity um, option now um, for, and that's generally considered for maybe uh, for shorter duration time. So say a, a site is winterizing um, and they're, they're ceasing operations for a few months out of the year, um, that inactive site uh, provision is more aimed towards that. Whereas longer periods of inactivity are probably best under a notice of termination, but it's up to the discharger to, to decide that. Um, and then a quick question, is the intent to make the new permit effective this year? It is not. Um, we do not have an adoption hearing scheduled just yet. And at the adoption hearing, staff will recommend uh, a time between adoption and effective date. Typically that recommendation is a year, but the board will make that determination at the adoption hearing. So um, permit effectiveness will not be in 2021. Um, and maybe and, not in 2022 we're not sure yet mm -hmm. and although staff recommends you know a year typically uh the board will definitely consider comments um especially during the consideration of adoption uh regarding that effective date great thank you and then um so we've got a last couple of questions here from mel on uh, caltrans projects um, folks, if you want to get your questions in, go ahead and submit them. Um, it's just about 11 o'clock and we have until noon. So um, if you'd like to ask your question, questions, now is the time. Uh, okay, so for Mel, uh, when we have large earthwork projects that can have two to 10 different stages, attachment H requires for Russell 2 modeling seems unachievable. And it looks like these are mostly in my area, Northwest California. We commonly will have a lot of active disturbed soil area that is constantly changing slopes and locations, and we manage it with dust control and perimeter controls. Attachment H makes it sound like each and every stage would require Russell 2 temporary BMP modeling numbers that prove TMDLs are met. However, I don't see how it is possible when disturbed soil areas are needed to be active and in constant change. I think our modeling based on Russell 2 numbers would show we need way more temporary BMPs, yet when you look at empirical evidence of discharge turbidity and pH, or even note that we commonly grade our large disturbed soil areas, projects do not dis discharge. When we commonly grade our large disturbed soil area, projects do not discharge that attachment H is unobtainable and unrealistic. Would you please comment on what the water board expects in terms of projects that seem like they will not be able to comply? And please comment on what the main thought is behind this modeling. As I have heard noted, the Russell 2 is needing so many upgrades. Also note that this could put even about 20 additional hours of QST SWIFT prep time. That, that time factor is pretty important. Um, thank you for providing that. And I, I do think we recognize that Russell 2 is not a perfect software or soil modeling um, equation, but it's what we've been using uh, throughout the 2009 permit. And um, there's room for improvement and we'll, we'll see if we can try and address that somehow. As far as would you please comment on the water board expects in terms of projects that seem like they will not be able to comply. Um, that's technically, if they're unable to comply with the requirements of the soil loss modeling, they're not complying with the our, uh, with the total maximum daily load. Um, so Mel, if we might wanna reach out to you to learn more about these types of scenarios and see how the, the, the soil loss modeling that we've incorporated into attachment H would really play out. Um, for these complex projects, uh, and then we'll hopefully come up to a better solution. 
Yeah, and then I'd also like to mention that um, this attachment H that you keep mentioning is for TMDLs. Mm -hmm. And so these requirements are specific to that TMDL and that pollutant water body combo. And so um, it may not be all of your sites in Northwest California. Um, it depends on whether you're a source of that pollutant. Uh, a lot of these that require Russell 2 modeling are metals that are bound to sediment or sediment mm -hmm. itself. So um, it just kind of depends on the area. And as Brandon said, we can certainly have a conversation. Mel, I think we've met before mm -hmm. um, and we're happy to chat with you and anyone else up in your district up there. So, Yeah, yeah and in region one, they only have uh, sediment total maximum daily loads. And some of those are complied with the construction general permit, but a majority of those will be relying on this Russell 2 modeling. Um, and this was a, a strategy that was developed with previous permit writers um, and one that was kind of kept when we uh, decided on our total mass on daily load implementation um, approach. And uh, in general, I thought, I believe it's supported um, to, to get away from having an additional uh, numeric effluent limitation or numeric action level specific to those sediment uh, and those mass-based loading waste load allocations. Thank you, Brandon. Mm -hmm. um, and then is there any way to bring back rainy season instead of watering down monitoring requirements because the monitoring program is the only thing protecting the LRP? So um, this is a little bit of a pet peeve for me. <laughs> <laughs> we don't really have a rainy season in California. It can rain at any time, especially as climate changes. Um, and especially since we are such a large state with um, varying microclimates. Um, and so to me, having a rainy season based permit uh, is not appropriate for all parts of the state and changing um, climate issues. Um, what we have done though, Hamid, is um, incorporated a seasonal visits from the qualified SWIP developer. And Brandon, can you remind me of the timing of those? Yeah, and so uh, I believe during the presentation, we mentioned that the qualified SWIP developer um, would be more involved on the site, and that includes on-site inspections. Um, and so we said that they would come, or we, we are proposing that the qualified SWIP developer um, visit the site twice annually, once um, between uh, August and October, and then once between um, January and March. And so that is kind of reflective of what we consider our, you know, potentially a, a rainy season, um, although it can rain at any time in California. Um, and so that August through October period is really to have the qualified SWIFT developer come out to the site and make sure that we, we are good for the months that we are considerably, or we can typically consider wetter. Um, and then January through March is, you know, still within that wet period and they can make adjustments as needed. But right. it, it really depends on where you are in the state too. Yeah. Because oftentimes in the mountains, it, you know, it, it rains uh, during the summer or spring. So. Great. I turned my video back on. Hopefully I won't lose connection again and hopefully my dog will stay uh, well behaved. Um, we got one more question here. Will the QSD site visits be uploaded to SMARTS or just kept on site? Um, I think as part of their site visit, they, they are expected to revise the SWIP as needed. So that would be um, amended via a change of information on SMARTS. Um, but their actual inspection checklist could probably just remain um, with the SWIP physically. Um, but they're also welcome to upload it to SMARTS as well. Yeah, um, SMARTS is maintained as a publicly accessible database. And um, I feel that the results of the inspection um, are more important to be uploaded to SMARTS than the inspection itself. So if you find during your inspection that there is um, something wrong and you take a corrective action and say you need to revise some BNPs or add BNPs, if you upload the amended SWIP with those revisions and additions, um, I think that that's more uh, beneficial for the public, for the regional water board inspectors to see, and also kind of um, shield you a little bit from the 
you know, public eye on, you know, exactly what you found in your inspections. As long as you've addressed it appropriately and amended the SWIP as such, that's what we're looking for. And that was the last question. So I'll give it a few minutes here. Um, if folks want to chime in, uh, we certainly want to hear your feedback and answer oh. your questions. Yeah, we see one more. There's Just one more up. from Holly. Great. Um, hi, Amy and Brandon. Great job on the revamp of the draft. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, I see huge improvements and major work inputs on your part. It is much appreciated. During the 2020 pre-draft meeting, I recall that there was uh, that there were no TMDL concerns in the greater Sacramento area. Has the list of TMDL constituents changed at all since the preliminary staff draft or has it remained the same? Mm -hmm. It has remained the same. So we have not added any total maximum daily loads um, to our current draft. Mm -hmm. And the reason that there are none in the greater Sacramento area is that uh, region five just doesn't have any total maximum daily loads that show construction stormwater as a source um, and therefore not applicable to mm -hmm. this permit. Holly is excited about that. Go ahead. <laughs> they, <Holly. laughs> the region five did um, submit total maximum daily, daily loads for review um, at the beginning of our, our drafting process. And we reviewed those and ultimately determined that they are not applicable to construction stormwater dischargers. Um, that said, I, I do want to mention in, in this workshop that uh, once this permit is adopted. If we were to, um, if regional water boards were to adopt total maximum daily loads that did include construction stormwater dischargers, that would have to be made as an amendment to this permit in order to have those um, uh, implemented through the construction stormwater general permit. Um, so that might either be during an amendment or another reissuance, um, but it won't be a part of the adopted. So. All the more reason to get it adopted quicker. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I think, the, yep, that is the last of the questions, comments. You guys had a lot of really good questions and comments today, a lot more technical than we heard yesterday. So mm -hmm. um, it just shows that two workshops are better than one. Um, oh, one more? Who, yeah. Who and what determines if one NPDS permit supersedes another? Um, so in this draft permit, we have language saying that if you have an individual NPDS permit um, that covers the same activities, then that would be the permit. So um, I haven't seen one in California, but sometimes there could be an individual permit for construction stormwater um, on any one site or entity. Um, and then also we have language talking about for example, the um, gasoline transmission NPDS permit, that is a separate permit. And in that instance, we point to it as a permit that you would use for any dewatering activity. Um, Diana, would you like to add to this? I would. Um, we, we work really hard to identify any duplicative permitting, um, especially if a state water board permit is duplicative of a regional board permit. And in the example you just provided, Amy, um, that would actually be the um, potential for the CGP to be duplicative of the state water board statewide natural gas facilities NPDS permit. Um, I would say that um, one permit cannot make another permit less stringent. And so um, when there are two permits that apply to the same type of discharge um, that most probably uh, the more stringent permit uh, supersedes or is what is in place. Um, but with that, you should always keep in mind if you do see that situation to uh, come forth to water board staff. Um, also, as we issue statewide permits, a lot of times we do it so that our regional boards do not have to permit the same type of activity. Um, however, after we do issue a statewide permit, a regional board may see that that statewide permit is not stringent enough for um, protecting water quality in their region. So they may go forward and adopt a more stringent permit for their region, 
or um, they may already have a more stringent permit in their region, which they expect their dischargers to comply with. Great. Okay, I think that is it. Um, I believe Diana answered Hamid's last question, which is, isn't performance standards that determines the which NPDS permit supersedes another? And I think she addressed that by saying, uh, you cannot use a less strict NPDS permit instead of one that is more strict. Um, great. If there are no other questions, um, we can wrap up and discuss what is next. Um, and if you have questions while I'm talking, just throw them in there, we'll try to answer them. Uh, but for next steps, we um, have the end of the public comment period being August 13th, 2021. And the state board hearing that's in front of the board members um, where they will take your written and verbal comments is August 4th, 2021. The public comment period is currently open and the public notice will tell you how to submit those written comments. Um, Brandon also went over it on the slide earlier. Um, I also will say that um, we will try to make this presentation available on our website as soon as possible. There are some things we need to go through in terms of making it accessible for those with hearing impairments. Um, I'm sorry, with uh, Visual, visual impairments. impairments. Yeah, thank you, visual impairments. Um, but we will get that up. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or Brandon. Our contact information is here on the screen. And also the stormwater at waterboards.ca.gov uh, email address is available as well. All right, seeing no other questions. Um, so folks are free to leave. Yeah. Thank you all for joining. It's a pleasure to work with all of the yeah. dischargers. We like engaging with all of you and look forward to responding to your comments. Yes. Oh yeah, and Dave wants to see the email addresses. Oh, sure. I will just put them in the chat. 